Financial Survival Network, helping you to survive and thrive in the new economy. Get our complimentary newsletter at FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com. This is the Financial Survival Network. You are listening to the FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com. I'm Kerry Lutz on 1230 WBZT, and it's time for another Triple Lutz Report. This is episode 301. It is Thursday, September 5th, 2013. Nobody slights this administration. Nobody says the truth without getting slapped. And Standard & Poor's on Thursday blasted a $5 billion fraud lawsuit filed by the U.S. government as retaliation for its 2011 decision to strip the U.S. of its AAA credit rating. And McGraw-Hill Financial, uh, of which S&P is a unit, was the only major credit rating agency to take away the U.S.'s top rating and the only one sued, coincidentally, by the Department of Justice for allegedly misleading banks and credit unions about the credibility of its ratings before the 2008 financial crisis. And why do you think that is? And in a filing with the U.S. District Court in Santa Ana, California, S&P said the lawsuit attempts to punish it for exercising its First Amendment free speech rights under the U.S. Constitution, but also seeks excessive fines in violation of the Eighth Amendment. Now look, I'm not letting off S&P because S&P was a prime enabler of the massive, and we're talking massive, mortgage-backed securities fraud that took place earlier in the decade. Without S&P and Moody's and the other bond rating concerns, none of the mortgage-backed security fraudulent schemes could have ever taken place because, look, Moody's, S&P, and the others rated these mortgage-backed securities AAA, and that enabled the packagers, the too-big-to-fail national banks, to then peddle these securities to unsuspecting pension funds, insurance companies, and other purchasers without the their imprimatur, without their stamp of approval, This would have never been possible, but obviously the government picking out, picking on S&P and not suing Moody's, who somehow I think is connected to uh, Warren Buffett, obviously this was retribution for taking away the U.S.'s AAA, coveted AAA rating, and notice that the rating should have been further reduced uh, due to the Congress's and the administration's inability to further reduce spending and cut back on the deficit, but it never happened. So the message got out that you don't mess with Uncle Sam, you don't mess with the credit rating, and the speech uh, prior restraint is alive and well in the United States. You know, it's been two years since the AAA rating was downgraded and only some smaller fringe um, rating agencies have cut the rating since, but it should have been further cut, but it's not going to happen, so all is well. Don't worry about it. And Justice Department, of course, refused to uh, comment on S&P's allegations S&P is seeking to dismiss the lawsuit lawsuit with prejudice so that it can't be brought again. The August uh, 011 downgrade of the U.S. credit rating to AA plus from AAA reflected the concern about Washington's ability to address the nation's swelling debt. Well, we're not even talking about the unfunded liabilities from Social Security, Medicare and Medicaid and all the other great things. Um, The February 4th lawsuit accused S&P of inflating ratings to win more fees from issuers. Exactly the point. It's true. But let's let's bring everybody to the party here, DOJ, not just S&P, 
because they made big guy in the White House look bad, and failing to downgrade ratings for collateralized debt obligations, despite knowing they were backed by deteriorating residential mortgage-backed securities, which is an oxymoron because nothing was backing these mortgage-backed securities. So U.S. District Judge David Carter in July allowed the case to go forward. You know, eventually there'll be a settlement on this, and the lesson will have been learned. And in Tuesday's filing, S&P estimated that more than $4.6 billion of the alleged losses may have resulted from the CDOs that were structured, marketed, or sold by BOA and Citigroup. It also said that more than $1 billion came from debt that was never issued in the first place. I don't quite get what that means. So S&P also said that the government lacked authority to sue under the Financial Institutions Reform, Recovery, and Enforcement Act of 89. So, so they... It's interesting that we had a Financial Institutions Reform, Recovery, and Enforcement Act in 1989. They keep passing these acts. They keep doing no good. You can't reform these entities. This is why we need the free market. The free market is the best reform and recovery act in existence. It will eliminate these corrupt and incompetent institutions over time. Just let it work. That's all we're asking. Let the free market work. And S&P has said its own statements about independence and objectivity about ratings were puffery that could not be taken at face value or be the basis for a fraud lawsuit. In other words, don't believe our lies. You can't believe anything we say. You know, we're full of it. So just stop right now. Um, anyone that believed us, you know, is basically a bunch of idiots. So just ignore what we said. Um, if you can't believe our lies, whose lies can you believe? You know, we're a bunch of liars. We're in that business. So how could you believe our AAA ratings in the first place, which gets to the point of why would you believe anything we say now if you couldn't believe what we said then anyway? You know, look, ratings are garbage. The ratings agencies try to figure out where you want to go, and then they lead you there. That's what Harrison Golden, who is the former comptroller of New York City, that's what he told us in a class in municipal finance in New York Law School many years ago. Everything that's happened since leads me to believe that he was correct and he knew what he was talking about then. And don't believe the rating agencies now. Maybe they're a little more vigilant because... They obviously looked quite bad then, but it's going to happen again, and they're supposed to be independent, but look, they're getting their fees from the issuers. Okay? The bond issuers, the companies that are putting together these securities and then going to sell them on the market, they pay the fees to Moody's, to S&P's, to Fitch's and to the others, except I think Weiss, they pay their fees. So obviously, obviously, S&P is not going to want to bite the hand that feeds it. It's just not going to happen. So when it comes to truly objective ratings, objective evaluations of securities, who are you going to believe? I think I'd go with Weiss who isn't getting paid by these issuing entities before I believe S&P. And I've got issues with Weiss too, but I don't want to go into them here. They seem to be pretty much on the level though. So next time you're buying securities, yeah, you can look at the research, look at their numbers. Just don't look at the rating because that's somebody's opinion and opinions. Well, you know what they say about opinions. This is a family show. So I don't really want to say what I think about opinions, but you know what I'm saying here. And next time somebody tells you about their opinion, think about it, okay? It's real important that you understand what their opinion means, the value of it, and there's nothing wrong with some disclosure about what their opinion is based upon. And when they're issuing their opinion, they should always say, 
We were paid for this opinion. Here's how much we were paid. Here's what we're earning off of our opinion. And here's why you should take our opinion with a grain of sand or a grain of salt, better yet. Because opinions are purchased on the open market. And sometimes they're bidding. There are bidding wars for these opinions. And McGraw-Hill, publicly traded company. And in the end of the day, they are going to report to shareholders and they're interested in maximizing their profits. There was a day when S&P was privately held and integrity was the most important product that they sold. And when you saw the name S&P, it was as good as gold, just like just like a US dollar too. Once upon a time, the US dollar was as good as gold, sound as a dollar. All those things applied. But you know what? Those days are gone. They're long since gone. They don't exist anymore, so forget it. Thing of the past. So the next time you see a rating agency rate something, forget about it. Doesn't mean a thing. Not worth the paper it's not written on. And you have to make those decisions for yourselves. I think the rating agencies mainly apply for big institutions because when you buy something, you'd say, well, S&P said it was AAA you know, you can't believe S&P. Who can you believe? A lot of funds, a lot of bond funds can only buy things if they're rated AAA um, by a major rating agency. So effectively, it's become nothing more than a scam, these ratings. Anyway, up next, I want to talk about the future of education. Something you need to think about, especially if you've got kids going to school there are some huge changes happening there. We've talked about it before. We're still going to be talking about it. It's Kerry Lutz on the Financial Survival Network. This is a Triple Lutz Report, episode 301, 1230 WBZT. Hi, it's Kerry Lutz. I recently decided to move my retirement account into physical precious metals to hedge against the coming times. If you want to move an existing retirement account into physical precious metals that you can hold in your hand tax-free, there's no company that can do it more quickly and efficiently than Regal Assets. It took them just 24 hours to open my new IRA account, and all I had to do was fill out one simple form. The best part is that Regal Assets does all the work for you. They cover the setup and administrative costs for 2013. If you're interested in making the same move I did, call 855-678-6620, 855-678-6620, that's 855 855- 678-6620 or visit them at regalassets.com. You'll be glad you did and tell them Carrie sent you. We're back. Carrie Lutz on the Financial Survival Network.com 1230 WBZT episode 301 Triple Lutz Report. So the future of education is now at hand. Online, accredited, affordable, and useful. And this was written by our buddy uh, Mike, a.k.a. Mish Shedlock. He says he's long been in the camp that the price of education is so expensive as to make college a poor choice for many who attend. And back when I attended, $1,500 a semester. Well, hey, you spend uh, twelve grand on a degree, 12000 you're basically going to break even on it at the worst. Now you spend 120000 you could very well lose out. And he says the entire education system is and has been for some time unsustainable. Well, if you listen to the Financial Survival Network, you know that we've believed that. And we've been watching this thing go down the tubes. And the reason why is quite simple. And the reason the cost of education is really simple, because because of uh, the rising, number one, government aid, number two, union contracts, number three, pension benefits, number four, salaries of coaches, number five, competition for the most elaborate dorms. I mean, man, you see these dorms, they're like uh, fit for royalty. I think the kids are living better than I am sometimes. Number six, fundraising. And 
he looks back at a guy named Dylan Matthews, and I have to go back and read this at the Washington Post. He's done a 10-part series called The Tuition is Too Damn High. That is a takeoff on a guy who ran for mayor of New York City on a party called The Rent is Too Damn High. And if you've seen the rents in New York City, you know that the rent is too damn high. And the first seven articles are out there. I'm going to be reading them. Do a triple Lutz report on them as well. Um, He makes some great points, though. Uh, one is called the dorm competition. You know, how much can we spoil the little brats? Um, there's a kid, Freddie DeBoer. He's a graduate at Purdue University, one of Indiana's flagship public research in- institutions. How the hell else are you going to get people to go to Indiana unless they've got these magnificent dorms? Indiana is in the Midwest. And... There's cornfields there in Indiana, and Purdue has a new gym, or as they call it, a sports center, the France A. Cordova Recreational Sports Center, to be exact. And DeBoer went to check it out. He found treadmills that each featured a TV and an iPod dock, a bouldering wall, and a 50-foot high climbing wall, a spa with a jacuzzi function that can fit 26 people, and hopefully no uh, illicit activity goes on there. Six racquetball courts and a demonstration kitchen for cooking lessons. I mean, where... I'm doing the wrong thing here. I mean, I'm thinking of uh, going back to school, me and Rodney uh, Dangerfield. And the Cordova Center wasn't an expense that needed to be paid for. It was an expense made because it could be made because the nonprofit university rewards those who spend money, not those who save it. So Mish says that the problem with education is largely that of government throwing more money at the problem. Sound familiar? Just as hundreds of affordable housing programs raised, not lowered the price of housing, um, that's what's happened with the educational system, and you throw in union graft, pensions, sports, and you have the problem in a nutshell. And the solution, as he says, and if you've heard me say it, it's really simple. Stop all student aid programs, increase competition via accredited online programs, and preposterous pension plans of educators and administrators. They're probably going to want to lynch myself and Mish at the earliest possible convenience. And What's happening now, number two, is now at hand in the form of more accredited online education at reputable institutions who are giving out affordable degrees at affordable prices. And we're talking about the MOOC that roared, and um, there's a master's at Georgia Tech, one of the best schools in the country, in computer science that is going to bust education, higher education, wide open. It's pretty amazing. And uh, Georgia Tech's uh, new super cheap online master's degree might just radically change American higher education. Uh, It's got a $6,600 program, and M-O-O-C stands for, what does that stand for? Yeah, MOOC stands for Massive Open Online Course. And 6600 bucks. you get this MBA. Um, it's got all of the main, the major colleges shaken in their boots. I mean, $6,600 for an MBA. You know, they charge 50000 a year at Stanford, Harvard, and Yale. And... It's not going to say on your diploma from Georgia Tech, online master's degree. It's going to look exactly the same as if you went to that school. And it's going to save, you know, their regular tuition uh, for out of state is forty five grand, and in state is twenty one thousand. So I expect they're going to have thousands of people lined up to take this course. It's going to be amazing. Uh, George Washington University has an MBA healthcare degree 
costs the uh, same as if you go there for it. So this is the beginning of the end for colleges. This is annihilation. And which ones will be left standing? That's really the question. Don't have the answer to that. But, you know, this is uncharted territory. As uh, Ziv Galil says, he's the head of Georgia Tech's School of uh, Computing. He basically said, if we don't do it, somebody else will. I think that's what uh, drug dealers say. You know, if we don't sell this stuff, then somebody else is going to sell the crack to them. So it might as well be me making the money. Um, you know, this is where all education's going. This is why teachers unions, you better actually explain to your members if they don't learn how to teach, um, illiteracy is going to go the way of uh, teachers unions because parents once they got the alternative to actually educate your kids, once you can see to it that I can send my child to the brick and mortar school on the corner where they will learn nothing, they will become functional illiterates and you will wind up being criminals or I can put them on an online academy where they will actually learn how to read, write, do math and become productive citizens well, hey, it's game over for you teachers' unions, you parasites out there. And I'm not saying every teacher is a bad teacher and everybody in the teachers' unions are evil, but the teachers' unions themselves are evil, parasitic entities that are more concerned about getting the maximum benefits, the maximum bang for the uh, taxpayer buck. They don't care about education. And if they did, they wouldn't participate in a system of New York City public education, L.A., or any of these major cities, they wouldn't be working for the Detroit public school system. And, you know, public education in the United States never got so bad until, until teachers' unions became trade unions. They used to be affinity groups, and they actually cared about the quality of education they were rendering to to their uh, pupils. Once they started caring about benefits and vacation days, and they lobbied to get every federal holiday off and every state holiday, then the quality of education went straight down the tubes. And, you know, I'm not letting the administrations off the hook or the government at all. They were part and parcel partners in the demise of education. But you guys are definitely at the top of the list for the demise of public education in the United States. We're helping, helping uh, produce generations of morons, of idiots, of stupid people who really are incapable of performing uh, the functions that society calls upon them to do and for requiring uh, importation of of foreigners to carry out vital jobs that Americans are no longer able or willing or have the skills to do. Thank you very much, teachers unions. You've done a wonderful job of dumbing down the country. If that was your intention, which I sometimes wonder, I sometimes believe it was, well, hey, you get an A for effort and an A++++ for results no one's done a better job of doing it than you so you should be really proud of yourselves and how do you look yourselves in the mirror when you go to school every day and you teach people absolutely nothing well i shouldn't say nothing you know you've you've taught people the art of using condoms and demonstrations with cucumbers and bananas i mean you've done exemplary work in sex education and teaching kids uh you know, atheism and godlessness. I mean, you should be proud in that respect. I know there are teachers out there trying to do a good job and you've got the deck stacked against you. If I were a teacher who actually knew something, who did a good job, I'd go to work for an online academy. I'd say, screw it. I don't want to be a part of this system. I can't look myself in the mirror. Can't look at myself in the face because I know I'm part of a failing system and I couldn't do it, but that's me. You got to do what you got to do. This is Kerry Lutz. Been another Triple Lutz report. Signing off.
Hey, if you're a coffee connoisseur like me, you need to try an amazing new roaster out of L.A., Tonks Coffee. These guys are fanatical about delivering the best beans in the world. They source directly from the growers, roast it, and ship it to you within 24 hours, so it's the most fresh coffee you've ever tasted. Every two weeks, you get a new batch of incredible beans roasted to perfection. If you're hitting a cafe most mornings, this is a much better and more economical way to get great coffee. Tonks is by subscription only, and they're offering you a free sample. Use the URL Tonks dot org slash liberty that's t-o-n-x dot org slash liberty get some for yourself or send it to someone you know who appreciates the finer things tonks dot org slash liberty again t-o-n-x dot org slash liberty the financial survival network helping you to survive and thrive in the new economy Get our complimentary newsletter at FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com. This is the Financial Survival Network. 